Let's all just take a breath. Yeah. Yep, they're giving me 15 minutes. I'm using one of them for this. It's been a week. It has been a week, Southwestern. Ooh, we all just need to breathe. One of those good deep breaths, the ones that like, you, you know, you breathe, you're like, just, and it like fills your whole lung. And then when after you exhale out of your, and then you can just like, you feel, you know what I'm talking about? Like the one where like the sigh, the long, that, that's what we all need right now. Yeah. You just survived midterms. That, that's, I thought that would get an amen. Some of you for the first time, right? Um, I, I think I can still see some of the tear stains from the freshmen. Hang in there. It's okay. I'm seeing some of the jaded looks from the upperclassmen. Yes, we've been here before. We survived before. We will survive again. <laughs> Let me pass on a little bit of advice from someone that has survived many seasons of midterms and finals in his life. The blessing isn't in the passing of the test. It is in the preservation and growth from the trial. I will never forget the feeling of passing my Hebrew final. Amen. Somebody better say amen. It was worth 60% of my overall grade in the class. Yep, yep, thank you. That is the correct reaction. Pretty much if you pass the Hebrew qualifier, you pass... Hebrew 2, and if you fail the Hebrew qualifier, you fail the class. What this meant for me, though, is that if I failed the class, I would automatically fail my Old Testament exegesis classes. It meant that I would have to add on another two years to my stay at the seminary. Essentially, it meant that I would not finish my degree. Everything came down to this test. I was so afraid of wasting three and a half years of my life. I was not prepared to feel like I had wasted my life in pursuit of nothing. The pressure was immense, and I thought, that the conference might drop me and I'd be out of a job. So back in the day, when I was there, I hate that I can say that now. <sighs> it happened so fast. Uh, they, uh, they would not email you your grade. They would post it on the wall in the glass of the department. Not with your name, but with like a code that they would give you ahead of time, right? And my buddy that was taking the class with me, he calls, because this is not something you text about. You need that, that in real time reaction. Bro, the grades are up. He says, do you, do you want me to tell you your grade? Let me know what your code is, and I'll look it up. And I said, uh-uh. <laughs> I, I got my skinny behind in my car, and I drove down there myself. I walked down the bottom of the seminary, down that long hall, to the end of the corridor, and I looked for my, for my code, and I looked for my grade, and then I looked again, and then I walked away, and then I walked back, because I wanted to make sure that what I had seen was the truth. I had passed my Hebrew qualifier, by a happy margin, by the way, a, a healthy mar I had passed it I, more than, pa I did well. <laughs> Ooh, it was rough. And between you and me, I don't remember those two weeks preceding the test. I, I don't know if I slept or ate or 
took a shower. I think I just stayed in my room and wrote over and over again with a whiteboard. You know what I'm talking about, all the Hebrew stuff over and over. Passed it. I passed it. And I think I, think I made it all the way to my car before I started to cry. It was a big, ugly cry, the kind that you see in the movies. I didn't know that it was real. I thought that this was like some fake dramatic thing that I don't know. It was not for me. But when I got to the car, the relief was so huge. But the true lesson that I have learned from passing that Hebrew qualifier came years later. Actually, if it came at all, it was about five minutes ago. We are only happy with God when His will is aligned with ours. Thankfully, He is not the same. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see, the pure in heart, well, the pure in heart will be able to see God. That doesn't, I don't know, that's a bit much. We're going to need to back up a little bit. I've been sitting here through all these, be ooh, can't even talk, through these beatitudes all week. And what I've learned is that there's some order to all of this. We've got to go back and trace through this for a few minutes. Because you see, every good sermon has a plan. But the Sermon on the Mount is a great sermon. It is the greatest sermon. So these Beatitudes that we've been talking about, they are intentionally written out in a specific order. Are you with me? Yeah. All right, let's go. Let's take a little look. Beatitudes 1 through 3 deal with, our, deal with a person in relation to God. This is just my little look-see, Luke, because this is the last time they're letting me speak for the thing. So, like, I'm going to say what I want to... Anyway. They might come back with some totally different thing when they get towards the end of the Beatitudes. This is what I got so far. The poor in spirit is up first, and that is recognizing your own brokenness. Okay? Then there's mourning, meaning mourning of the... Uh, the destruction that the sin in our lives has caused. And then there's meek, which is to be confident that God watches us. Then there's the fourth, and it pivots. It's a little different. The fourth, hunger and thirst for God, starts to make possible all the other beatitudes, beatitudes which deal with our relation to other people. They're all built on each other. There's an organized method behind all of this. Mercy for others is made possible with a correct view of our own broken spirit. Did you understand that? Mm. And the pure in heart are people that have mourned the destruction that sin has caused in their own lives. They are built on each other. Are you with me? Did you follow me through that, Southwestern? Okay, here we go. Better buckle up. And you already know. I'm being quiet now, but... I'm... Blessed are the pure in heart. We've been talking about this theme of the heart being the target throughout all the Beatitudes. But in this one, Jesus hits the nail right on the head. It's the pure of heart that see Jesus, not the pure of action. This is not about intellect. It's not blessed are those who understand the Bible and believe all the right doctrines. A person can believe all the correct doctrines and still falsely, mis and still falsely represent God. This may be part of what is happening in the story of Onesimus, that story, uh, the Philemon story, the little tiny book that we, yeah, where is it? Somewhere in the New Testament? I don't know. Hebrews, close to that. That one. 
It's this little letter that Paul wrote to the church that met in Philemon's house. It's a tiny letter to a tiny church dealing with a huge problem. You see, Onesimus had stolen something from Philemon. We don't really know what it is. But he ran away, and while he was gone, he ran into Paul. And while he was with Paul, Onesimus' heart started to change. See that theme popping up again? Paul says that he once was useless. This is what he says in the book of Philemon. He's talking to Philemon. He says, Onesimus once was useless, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. Onesimus has undergone a transformation. Paul then decides to send Onesimus back to Philemon, which is why he writes the letter to Troy try and smooth things over a little bit. See, you can believe all the right doctrines and still push someone away from Jesus. We do it all the time. We believe, uh, 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 well, I believe in the right day to keep Sabbath, okay, but you're a mean person and I want nothing to do with you or your Sabbath. Oh, oh, I believe in the correct view of the state of the dead. Fantastic. Uh, But have you invited Lazarus to eat at your table? And who is your Lazarus, by the way? Is he the person you don't like because he wears, because he doesn't wear a mask in church? Or is he the person you don't like because he asked you to wear one? Is everyone uncomfortable? What the Beatitudes do is they point out our own flaws so that we will feel the need to seek out Jesus. Are we or are we, all, or are we not all in the same boat? Well, my part of the boat is much more beautiful and organized than my brother or sister's part of the boat. <laughs> Who cares? We're all in the same boat. If my boat is sinking, your boat is sinking too. They didn't like Onesimus. They didn't like Onesimus. This is what I think I might be wrong. There might be a theologian somewhere that will challenge me on this. But I don't think they liked Onesimus. But one thing is for sure. He had to leave the church to find Jesus. Philemon and company, the people meeting in his house, their hearts were divided. That's the opposite of a pure heart. A divided heart heart. They were unable to see Onesimus as an equal, and so the very person that they should have been sharing the hope of the gospel to was the one that they cut off. Blessed are the pure of heart. An undivided heart is powerful, but your heart can only be undivided if you're okay with the outcome of whatever you're hoping for going the other way. I promise you I'm preaching more to myself than I am to anyone else in the room. For those of you still maybe feeling the burns on your toes from Wednesday, I promise you I'm preaching more to myself than I am to anyone else in the room. I am only happy when the story works out the way that I planned. Is the storm still bothering you? Anybody else? Remember this when finals come around. I wasn't prepared for my midterm to go the wrong way, the wrong way. But I have to remember that I don't see things the way that God sees them. You see, I finished my MDiv at Andrews, and I was dropped by the conference anyway. They didn't have a job for me. And so began a storm in my life that I can now tell you led me down a better path. God saw a view of my future that I couldn't. The pure of heart are able to sit through the storm because their eyes are on Jesus. With Jesus as the captain, we can... Are you ready? Are you really ready? Ooh, we're going to get real for just a second here. Are you really ready for God's will to be done in your life? 
I know that I am not. Can I be honest with you? God's will is scary sometimes. But there's good news. Not only does God pay the price for all of us, but he helps us to want to accept the help too. Let the Holy Spirit in and he will start to reorder your heart and make it different. He will start to make it undivided. He will, he will make it pure. Go to him now. He is waiting, waiting for you.